And the first question is, could you say who you are? Okay, I'm Sue Crockford and I live in North London and I'm still in my same Women's Liberation Group after 46 years. We never closed, like the windmill. And it's wonderful. It's Apart from you know your friends and family and the people you love, I suspect that feminism has been the most powerful influence in my life. You know, and that's including being the Vietnam movement and anti-apartheid and stuff like that. But the, the feminism movement, I think that's the secret. The word movement, it ain't a party. Although we do have parties, which is extremely nice. But I think very, very early on I got scared or... Not scared, but disattracted, is that a word? It is now. Right, um, by the very heavy left. I thought, they don't laugh a lot. And was it Emma Goldman? If I can't dance, I don't want to join... Oh. It's not my revolution. Yeah. It's not my revolution. I thought, I like this. I mean, uh, I like cracking up and having a laugh. And why would you want a revolution if your future society didn't laugh and have parties? I mean, it's so obvious, in my view. And I think one of the nice things at the beginning of the women's movement, quite bright groupings, Tory party, forgive me, but they are quite bright sometimes, Primrose League, used to invite us to go and talk there. And you think... Why are you doing this? They wanted to know the enemy. So we'd go, me and all of me and someone else, or some, you know. The enemy because you were socialists? It was the new women's movement, and it got loads of publicity, so they thought, I think we'll just find out who they are. So they'd invite us to go and address them. So we'd go and talk, and they we'd sit next to each other on a platform or whatever, and say, I have no idea what Ward's going to say. But I trust her so completely that even if she says something different from me, that's perfectly fine. And they were used to people almost coming with an agenda and uh, having thought out in advance what you were going to say. And I thought what we were trying to show was the trust between us in this movement was so great that whatever Ord said, wherever she'd come from, why she got into the movement, what she thought it was about, might be different from mine, but the core common ground was so broad, we'd agree. And it was wonderful. And I think people used to come up to us afterwards and say, well, we've had the Labour Party, we've had the this and the that. And they all came with an agenda and a leaflet. We never came with leaflets, probably should have done, but... It was actually quite interesting. Some of the most interesting conversations were with people who we had some fundamental disagreements with, but, say that core level of women, like the Primrose League are all women, or whatever you call the people from the round table who are the women's lot of it, suddenly you could start talking about childcare and would you bring your boys up differently from... And you had a real, real conversation, which quite often, as you know, in politics, there's a conversation here which is about politics, and there's the rest which is about life, and this all bled into each other, which some people, some political groups found messy, but I like mess, and I think if you've got to have real life and you want change on the planet, it's messy, you know. Tell us about becoming a feminist. <sighs> Joining the women's movement or becoming a feminist. Well, it never crossed my mind I wasn't, if you think. I went to a girls' grammar school. I was the eldest child and a girl. My mum brought me up for the first two and a half years on my own. Um, so I was brought up vocals, singing, larking around. My dad came back and apparently I thought he was a postman. But so, and then... Came back I, from the war. Yeah, but they kept them ages in the Middle East. I don't know why, but... Um, I think what was interesting in the grammar school, everybody was a woman in those days, so long before the revolution, men went in to run school. So all the science and maths people were women. So it didn't cross your mind that there were subjects you couldn't study, things you couldn't be, except my head teacher said when I wanted to be a director, come down to earth, my dear girl. But it was quite an interesting environment to be in that was all run by women. And my hero was Robin Hood. I didn't think I really wanted to be made Marian, but um, we didn't really feel we had limits. We weren't pushed into feeling we had limits if that makes sense. We weren't encouraged to be rocket scientists. You know, I think we were encouraged to be nurses and teachers and whatever else, but I never wanted to do any of that. So I think when my own daughter went to school, I sent her to a girls' school till she was 15 and then mixed for a sixth form. I mean, I thought about it hard at the time, and I thought it's no bad thing. You know, being in a female-only environment when you're actually a teenager, when you're just about to be pushed into making heavy-duty decisions vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, sex and men and women and stuff. So going to a girls' grammar school was actually really, probably quite formula, you know, was quite important. So, so then women, um, we did uh, anti-apartheid university, which was just, I couldn't believe anybody did any of that stuff. 
and that was a lot of women as well because some of the, my friends were women who'd been kicked out of South Africa so I didn't think about men and women being different. Vietnam was interesting because again we were a movement and then some of the women I was with in the Vietnam movement um, were American and we got a lot of our politics two years behind the line from the States. So I thought this is really interesting stuff. Um, and the two or three people who I was living next door to, I thought, I really thought about it, I really thought about it, because a couple of the blokes, including my own, were not scathing, they wouldn't have been so stupid as to be scathing, but almost thought, this isn't proper politics. So I had to sit, almost on my own, and think, well, why isn't it proper politics? And in those days, it was economics, Vietnam, that was all proper politics. And then some of these blokes would go home and be not the world's most beautiful partners. And you think... Surely your politics, what you believe in your politics and how you live your life, they should be like that. They shouldn't be like that. The personal is political. Uh, yes, it's funny you should say that. That was the phrase that came in at the time. But we had, even when I was making the Mary Wollstonecraft film, this wonderful bloke, he didn't believe it. Quite, quite a famous historian, he did not want to say the lines. So it went back quite deep. The generation just before me, very formally political, to say the person was political was hard work. They didn't believe it. Some of them felt they had to say it, but they didn't really believe it. Why did you set up a, this women's liberation group that is still going 46 years later? What was the, the, foc the focal point that made it happen? Do you know, I'm not absolutely <laughs> sure. I should be, shouldn't I? There was an incredibly charismatic woman in my Vietnam group who was an American doctor who'd come over here and she was um, incredibly bright. She was a bit older than the rest of us, I mean five or six years and I and she was the one that kind of uh, was talking about childcare and I just got a three month old, well at least I only missed, I gave birth to him and I missed one meeting, one Vietnam meeting for the, the next week and then came back and then I thought a lot about how I'm going to raise this child who was a boy and thinking, well, I want a kind, thoughtful, intelligent, creative, egalitarian son. And she, when we were making um, the film about the, the first Oxford conference, the beginning of the women's movement, she was the one that said um, children benefit from many kind and loving people. And in those days, a woman and a kid were supposed to be the unit. It, it was almost like you weren't supposed to spread out towards lots of other people to be part of that child's upbringing. Um, I'm being a bit extreme, but does that make a bit of sense to you? And I learnt an amazing amount from her. And when I say we were a couple of years behind the States, we were. I mean, when we picked up Newsroom New York films, I mean, they'd been making political films two or three years before us. I mean, it was expensive in those days. You had to, I won't go into all that. But I admire the, the, the people that I'm, I didn't know ordinary Americans. The Americans that I met were radical. They'd been through the movement. They'd been in, you know, South Francisco. They'd been all over there. And I just came out thinking, I can learn an amazing amount from these people. So, in a way, a couple of these women, oh no, one Canadian woman, who'd been a person who'd received draft dodgers, you know. So, most of the people that we met from the other side of the pond were radicals, which made absolute total sense to me more radicals than I met here, really. Well, we were doing good now. Stop. Can't remember what I was going to say now. So, tell me I'm about being very when you started using the F word, feminist. feminist, what sorts of responses did you get from other women, other political uh, people, boyfriends? Boyfriend, one of them was, yeah, my partner at the beginning, who's now a deep Australian feminist. That's impossible. That's a contradiction in terms, Sheila. Yeah. What do you call oxymoron? <laughs> Just more. American intelligence <laughs> oxymoron. Yes, he was at the beginning. He just people said we'd split the left. It's a bit like um, you know the Greens and the Lib Dems now. People actually said you'll split the left, and I thought, well, if it's that splittable, then you know, really, we ought to be redefining the left. And I suppose. Yeah, we got that re response. Some of the heavy duty, well, my mum, people, you know, people who read the Daily Mail were going, what? It was not feminine behaviour. And some of the things I was doing, like not marrying on principle, horrified them. 
you know, I think I said to you before, if I'd been abandoned at the altar, that would, oh, there, there, dear, that would have been all right. But no. The idea of deliberately flouting or going against current law, like wanting to put MERS on your passport, it took me six months to get MERS on my passport. It was Miss or Mrs. And you look at kids now, you say, oh, I'm not a feminist, and you say, do you put MERS? Of course we do. Darling, we fought for that. You know, and it's almost like the water table. Quite a lot of people who say they're not feminists, you talk to them about their expectations, and the expectations are now here. You know, 40 years ago, socially, they were down there. And we got, you know, we've always whistled out or things would happen. And it, it, it was hard. It, you know, I didn't meet anybody till Barn was about a year who deliberately not got married. And I hid it, I, I hid it from everybody, including my partner. You know, that I, it really upset me because I thought I've, it took me a lot of effort to make that decision, if that makes sense. Um, now you look back and every, everybody's making those decisions, but when it first happens, it's, it's, you pay a price. You do pay a price. This is a difficult question and perhaps you sort of say that you're not qualified is, can you compare the sorts of everyday sexism, as the expression goes, I, I don't know, are you familiar with the Everyday Sexism Project? No. Okay. No. Um, then and now, um, but just very quickly, the Everyday Sexism Project is in, was set up by a woman who just got hassled a lot more during one week than was normal, and she, she thought that it was just her, but found out pretty yeah. quickly when she set up the blog that this is pervasive and invasive and persistent and now that there's the internet people are able to people sort of share. sharing stuff but I mean what's your sense? Okay no you're right there was a point at the, quite early on in the women's movement we sat a group of us and poured onto the table the things that were really deeply worrying us and then we gradually realized that some of this was simply personal my brother my whatever and half of this was social but we hadn't discussed it like that before and I think in a way that was the beginning of thinking that stuff that we share we should do something collectively about um, and that stuff that we, do, we, we just sort out and I think that was oh and we did a, a screening of the girls my Zetteling don't know it. it's an update of Lysistrata um, <laughs> and at one point there was these three actors they're very different they're sitting in a coffee bar, they're really talking, finally they've got through their enmity towards it, and they really have this amazing conversation, a bottle of wine comes over, they say, no, 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 we didn't order this, send it back, it comes back again, and the waiter says, um, thank you very much, thank you very much, but we don't want it, anyway, it goes back again, third time, he comes over and says, you turned it down, and they said, yes, we're just going, you bunch of slags, and we all, the whole audience went, because oh, we'd all been there. It was this mixture of uh, apparent charm and we really find you sexy and all of it. Underneath it all was this absolute aggression towards us. How dare these three women be so self-sufficient in themselves they didn't want a bottle of wine sent over by this bloke. And it was this collective intake in an audience that normally you don't get. You, you don't get either that shared experience, right? Or that any of us at the end, because we were all having conversations, went, things like that have happened to us. So you, this was a film showing that you were putting on... We were showing in the Phoenix because we were all radical filmmakers and um, we would do screenings and I think I said to you before, one of the things we did was because most people aren't that confident, we'd have little groups having discussions before we went into a big group. So if you were quite a shy woman, you think, oh, I'm never going to put my hand up. But if you were in just a group of eight for half an hour, you would have a conversation and then maybe if someone said would you like to be the rapporteur maybe they do it but we had a lot of the best conversations in these tiny groups but you're talking about some things that lead up to it i remember going for this job you know being like about the first woman running this youth center and thinking i was going to do it and at the interview all men surprise surprise one of them said um a lot of money for a young woman, isn't it? And I had the wit, thank God, to say, would you say that to a young man? <laughs> God, did I dare say that? And what the bloke that I then later on became close to was my semi-boss, just, I saw him hiding this smile, thinking, she's actually said it. But I was so shocked that someone says a lot of money for a young woman. 
this is 71, 72-ish. How old am I? 72. I am 72. So yeah, uh, no. Yes, about then. Yeah. And these were, it's like not putting muds on your butt. You think that's what they're really thinking, even if they don't say it all the time. That's actually what they're really thinking. And that's scary. And these blokes are in charge of your life. They were like 40 to 50 year old blokes. And oh, was this woman I'm thinking? Hang on. But unless it comes out like that, I, if I thought about it too much, I wouldn't have had the courage to have said it. And this is me, I'm a bolshie cow. But I would have been shy then to have said anything like that because I wouldn't have known anybody. My parents would have been, if I told them, they would have been appalled at my bad manners. Last question for now. Yes. There'll be plenty more. You were saying before we turned on the camera that you were encouraged that Taylor Swift yeah. was identifying as a... Feminist. Feminist, yeah. Do you want to... Could you just expand on that? I just think it's a wonderful word. I mean, like, I wouldn't want to be close to anybody who wasn't a feminist. I can't imagine a good man not being a feminist. It's, um, it's like when you sometimes you get some tricky men and you think you've got a daughter and a son, do you want to bring them up equally? Well, yes, of course. And you think, well, that's that's feminism. And yes, I think she's got guts because she's in the public eye and she's said stuff, and a lot of women have said stuff recently about, you know, why should we be damping ourselves down? Um, and there's no different. I mean, she has to look good, and she does look good. It was almost like you're positing, why couldn't a woman be attractive and look good and an intelligent feminist? They are not mutually exclusive.